Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Igberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being here with us. We have a very special guest today. You know, um, I heard a whole lot of info in the progressive space that say, Igberto, you got to speak to this uh, woman, the progressive woman in Maryland that's going to be taking over the, the, the one and only Elijah Cummins spot. Maya R. Cummins, how are you doing today? I'm well, but I'm delighted to be with you today, Egberto. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. So first of all, um, there, are, there are, I mean, there are so many people that are so impressed with you. They, are, they told me, this is a, the Maryland 7th District needs to have a Maya involved now, because once and for all, we need to break out of several things. One, we need to get out of the patriarchy, that male-dominated thing. And secondly... We need somebody that is not just standing for the status quo, but is ready to do that. So please tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all, Maya. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I think most people think my bio point is that, you know, I was married to Congressman Elijah Cummings and I was proudly married to him. But before we ever got married, I was already in the trenches fighting uh, for social justice. Uh, and, um, you know, I worked on Capitol Hill on the House Ways and Means Social Security Subcommittee. I was a chief of staff for former Congressman Charlie Rangel of New York. Um, I have worked in the progressive uh, advocacy and think tank space, uh, serving as a senior resident scholar for health and income security at the National Urban League and a vice president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Uh, so I have been in the trenches for a long time, uh, starting in Capitol Hill in 1997. Uh, and I am progressive. I have been fighting and have stood for a single payer national health plan for more than 20 years. Uh, I have uh, stood for and continue to fight for uh, universal family care. Uh, I have stood for and continue to fight for equity and economic justice. Uh, there are too many places like Baltimore with deep levels of inequality across the country. And we frankly need to do something about it. And the coronavirus epidemic, the pandemic that we're currently in, only shows us, uh, doubles uh, my dedication to why we need to address this. Now, uh, I want to talk about what Maya is going to do for the district, first of all. But before that, I think it is you, you, one must draw a contrast and give people the reason why uh, they should take on somebody that doesn't have as high a profile as one's opponent as such. Kwasi yeah. Mpume has a hell of a lot of name recognition. And there are a lot of people within the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus, that have a lot of name recognition. Let me tell you where I stand from somebody watching national politics specifically. I see a lot of people running on names. I see a lot of people running on organizations. But I see a status quo within black and brown communities that's, that, that maintains a certain constancy. Uh, we constantly hear these people coming and say, this is what I'm going to do. And I think if things stay the same, it's insanity. That's a Absolutely. definition of insanity to do things over and over. So while we're going to talk about what you're going to do, what is it about Kwasi and Fume that is not a fit for that district? So Mr. Mfume had his chance. He ran for the seat and won it uh, more than 25 years ago. I mean, more than 30 years ago. Uh, he is a 20th century candidate and we are in the 21st century. Uh, when he ran and won, he did not prove himself to be a leader. He did not prove himself to be transformative and he did not prove himself to be progressive. Uh, I think Mr. Mfume uh, is currently in the pockets of Big Pharma. Uh, and historically, you know, he was the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, when the 94 crime bill uh, was passed, he not only voted for it, but he was an active champion for it. And he rallied the other Congressional Black Caucus members to get behind it. And the question becomes is what did he get for it? Uh, and he certainly got nothing for the African-American or black and brown communities for it. Uh, in fact, he was responsible. He was tasked uh, with getting the, the Racial Justice Act, which was uh, an act that was designed to make sure that death row uh, 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 defendants had the ability to use aggregated data uh, to show racial biases uh, in the justice system uh, in order to make their argument and their defense uh, for life. Uh, and he didn't even win that. Uh, he gave that up early. 
uh, and while continuing to advocate for passage of the criminal, uh, the, the 94 crime bill. And everybody knows what happened there. You know, black and brown men especially ended up going to jail for nonviolent, primarily drug offenses uh, in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, so Mr. Nfume, frankly, is not right for this time. It's time for us to move forward, uh, not move backward. It's time for us to have an equity agenda, and that is what I'm running on. I love the way you say that it's time for us to move forward. There are a lot of these other people that had their chances, as you said, to make a difference in the community. Now, I've been to Baltimore several times. There are two Baltimores, and we all know that. There are two Baltimores, and we know where that stands. I hope, I hope that uh, more, I, I, I respected what uh, Congressman Elijah Cummins constantly tried to do. I respected how he was among the people. I respected all of that. Now, I, I see that in the research that I've been doing about you. I see you are the, you can't do it now, but the touchy-feely uh, person with the people of the community. And I think that is what, it, what is really needed out there. Now, you came out with something known as the Bold New Deal for uh, COVID-19 and the 21st century. I want you to uh, sort of expand on that and let people know exactly what that means, not in terminology for, let's say, you and me who understand policy, but for that guy that is riding down those streets on Baltimore on a bike that needs a reason once and for all to go out there and vote. For that, per that mother that is sitting down in the house that needs a reason once and for all to go out and vote and say, this time it's gonna make a difference. Americans are hurting, and they were actually hurting before the coronavirus hit. Uh, and so what we have here in this country uh, is intense pain. Uh, and that pain is that workers have been trying for, for decades now to get ahead uh, with no actual um, you know, result. Uh, now we have more than 24 million unemployed Americans. We've got essential workers working on the front lines with no personal protective gear, almost practically ensuring uh, that they're going to catch the coronavirus and perhaps horribly bring it home to their families. Uh, we have people who are desperate. They don't know whether to hold on to their, uh, you know, their jobs at the, you know, the supermarket or at the meatpacking plant uh, or to quit and enter the lines of the unemployed. Uh, and, and, and people are desperately food insecure. Uh, you know, if they are unemployed or if they were already on food stamps, otherwise known as SNAP, uh, you know, they were, their benefits were already running out uh, before the end of the month. We do not have an adequate safety net in this country and we need one. So the bold new deal for the coronavirus COVID-19 basically calls on us to Protect our frontline workers. If the president, and I say this lightly, number 45, uh, actually believes that we're in a war against an unseen enemy called the coronavirus, then that means that we all need to be treated like uh, uh, soldiers on the front lines. And soldiers on the front lines, having come from a military family, get universal access to health care. Uh, they get dental care. Uh, they get the equipment to make sure that they are able to protect themselves. Uh, they get uh, and, and they have food assistance. Uh, they have an adequate income to make sure that they get uh, the, the kinds of uh, things that their family needs, have the income that their family needs. Uh, and so and they certainly get uh, to make sure uh, that um, uh, that, you know, that the shelter is available. So what the Bold New Deal calls for uh, is universal access to care immediately, particularly for those frontline workers who need hazard pay on top of their regular pay, uh, who need the PPE. We need to guarantee their PPE. We need to guarantee that access. It is unacceptable uh, that we have frontline workers without access to health care. We need to guarantee and make sure uh, that they have shelter. Uh, and we need to make sure that we are uh, addressing the food security needs of American, the American people across the country. Those are just a few of the highlights of the bold new deal uh, for the coronavirus era. Now, uh, that, is, that is great because I, I'm, I, we are yearning to have people in Congress that understands that. We're yearning to find people in Congress who understand that, first of all, the money is there. Many like to make, come under the impression that we can't afford it. Of course, we can always expand the money supply, quantitative easing and otherwise when it comes to corporations. Let's, make, let's do it for people now. And that is what I'm hearing in your voice, that you're out there saying, let's make sure and 
take care of uh, uh, people first. Now, Maya, I think um, that uh, more than likely, if I understand it correctly, uh, the establishment has a preferred candidate. How do you tell the people why you should be the preferred candidate and to take a chance on you? Personally, I don't think it's a chance. But why should they it's take not a, a chance. chance. I you? have a more than 25, a 20 year track record of progressive getting things done, rolling up my sleeves and getting things done. I stood on the front lines to take on George W. Bush's efforts to privatize Social Security. And I helped beat a sitting president of the United States of America. I will always protect and defend our social safety net and our social insurance system. Uh, I have been on the front lines of making sure that we have healthy communities. For 10 years, I led an initiative called Leadership for Healthy Communities that fought for healthy food access, that fought for green spaces and safe places to play for young kids, that fought uh, to make sure that childhood obesity and obesity in general is something that we are focused on and making sure that we have healthy populations where we address health disparities. I have had a proven track record on all of these issues, including public education, where I think it's unconscionable that if we're in the wealthiest nation in this world, uh, we're still relying on the relative wealth of the school, uh, of, the, uh, of the, 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 the homeowners and the districts where children live in order to educate and finance our children's education. We can do better than this. We are better than this and we need to do better than this. And I stand for a progressive agenda that is forward thinking uh, and I'm ready to roll up my sleeves because I have current relationships on both sides of the aisle, unlike my candidate who hasn't been there in more than 25 years. I, uh, you know, I've been called to testify on, on both sides, on the House side and the Senate side, on Social Security issues. I'm considered an expert. I have advocacy relationships that I am ready to just uh, basically spark. Uh, and so I am ready to lead on day one and be the voice for the people. In closing, Maya, uh, what have I not asked that you would have liked to say? I just want to say that, you know, I am also very much uh, in the mold of my husband and I'm about integrity uh, and I'm about standing for the right thing and doing the right thing for the people, for the people. Uh, and so with that, you know, this is about uh, advancing uh, Elijah's legacy. It's about standing up for and defending our democracy as well, making sure that I'm standing strong against Donald Trump and the Republican agenda to take us back 60 plus years. Uh, and so with that, you know, we have work to do. This is a battle for the future of our democracy. And I am ready to stand on the front lines fighting that battle. Maryland District, Congressional District 7. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. One hopes that you do the right thing. Maya Cummins, it's been my pleasure to speak to you. It's been my pleasure to listen to you. And I think you would do very well for the district. Thank you, Egberto. Thank you so much. I'm Egberto Woolies, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much.